you know, natural resources is an alternative investment. Money Moves likes to focus on especially water. Shortages are making clean water sources around the world more valuable, prompting some to call it the oil of the 21st century. We're seeing some of that right here in the U.S. in an escalating battle over water rights between the states of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. It's an issue our next guest has been watching very closely. Peter Orzak, President Obama's former budget director, now a columnist for Bloomberg View. Peter, welcome. Welcome. Uh, great Good to, to talk to you. Great to have you here. Tell me how big a concern this is. Well, it's a growing concern. There are specific issues where uh, water problems are already breaking out. You mentioned the one uh, surrounding Atlanta in particular. But more broadly, one of the key problems that we face is the U.S. actually doesn't price water sufficiently. So uh, in the United States, we consume 100 to 150 gallons per person per day. In Europe, it's about half that, and it's not surprising because their prices are higher. Well, you know, they're much better about this in Europe. I mean, you know, you, they, they actually turn off the faucet when they brush their teeth. Um, well, they have an incentive to, to do so, though. Well, do they? Yeah. I mean, so what's the difference there? There's a market incentive that's built into yeah, water prices, there where it's just not here? Prices are, it depends on the country, but uh, can often be twice as high in Europe as they are here. And all of the evidence suggests if you raise prices in the U.S., for example, by 10 percent, consumption would fall, residential consumption, by 3 to 4 percent. Instead, what we tend to do, like in New York, we spent $300 million replacing toilets during the 1990s to low flush uh, ones. We tend to have a regulatory approach like that. And the problem with a regulatory approach is people... Uh, find ways around it. So you're so, saying, why not just change the demand equation? It's why not much more efficient. Consumers? And then technology follows from that. If you if you have the price incentive, technology follows along. Okay, so how would you do that? I mean, people would, would balk if they said, wait a second, you're going to charge me for water? Something that, you know, I consider as free as the, sure. the air I breathe? Well, we already do. I mean, the vast majority, over 90% of Americans are already metered in the sense that they are paying something for water. It's just the price is very low. So I think the best way of doing this is what's called increasing block pricing. So you get a certain allotment basically for free or at a very low price. And then as your consumption goes up, if you're a very high consumer, you get charged more and more. And that's a good way of building an incentive while cushioning the sort of core needs or the, the basic needs from Would you do this on, say, a per capita basis in a household? Because what about the family with eight kids that says, well, you know what, we get eight kids taking a shower every day. Sorry, we're going to use could, more you water. You could adjust for the number of people in the household if you want mm -hmm. to, sure. And would some places be given a bigger allotment in, in your scenario here? I mean, if, if you live uh, in California, would you be um, penalized because, you know, you're in California and they experience more well, drought? Well, this is the other thing. It's the, the water markets are very localized, so and water shortages are very localized. So they're, they're, we're not talking about a national approach here. It's just in each different area, as you run into uh, shortage problems, uh, relying more on the price signal, I think, would be a better approach than the ones that we have traditionally adopted of, you know, the low flow shower heads and time of use uh, restrictions and what have you. And well, people then always people find. Say, hey, I, I need to go buy a shower head that's going to use less water because if I don't, I'm going to get charged more. Not only that, but when you just do it through the regulatory approach, what tends to happen is people take longer showers. Or if you have a time of use restriction, you know, you can only uh, uh, water your lawn during a certain period of time, they, they water it more. Whereas if you've got the price incentive, you don't, you don't create those kinds of distortions. Okay, so bottom line, create a market economy for water. Have we seen examples? You mentioned Europe. What are some examples or case studies that you've looked at worldwide where you really feel like this kind of formula would work? Well, we've, and I should say, we have made progress here in the United States. One, you know, evidence suggests that when you simply meter water, that is, so households face some charge for mm -hmm. it, consumption goes down by 20 or 30 percent. And it's now, we, we've had a dramatic increase. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of households in the U.S. now do face, uh, or at least have their water metered. So. Okay. That's progress. I, I don't. I can't point to the you know utopian. Uh, How much area. Would, you, would you have water prices go up? It's it's very localized. It will depend. Uh, a percentage like ballpark. I mean, how much more do we need to be charging in order for people to care? In severe water shortage areas, it might be at the margin for very high intensity uh, uses, uh, doubling or even tripling. Okay. In other areas, no increase is necessary. Okay. It really varies. We are back with Peter Orzag, President Obama's former budget director, now a columnist for Bloomberg View and a vice chairman at Citigroup. We want to turn to the debate on health care. Day three right now of arguments before the Supreme Court about whether President Obama's plan is actually constitutional. 
Peter, you helped write that plan. What do you think here? Do you think it should be ruled constitutional? I imagine you do, but after yesterday's arguments, are we even going to get there? Well, three things. First, there are, there's a lot going on in the healthcare market, even apart from the debate over the mandate, which is where the Supreme Court is focused. Uh, healthcare costs have decelerated or slowed down a lot over the past few years. And it's good one news. The, one of the big questions is how much of that is because providers are moving towards uh, higher value and more efficiency, and how much is just because the economy has slowed down. But there's a lot happening in healthcare, even apart from this Supreme Court. Drama. Okay, but, 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 I mean, can we see, do you think we will see uh, the Supreme Court rule that this is unconstitutional? Well, that's the second thing I was going to say, is, is people are uh, kind of getting all a flutter from trying to interpret questions and whether that means that justices will vote in particular ways. And I think that's a, a kind of dangerous game to be playing. Lots of concern I, about Justice Kennedy right now. As the his swing questions. vote, absolutely. Um, I actually, my Bloomberg View columnist uh, colleague, Noah Feldman, I think uh, in a piece this morning on Bloomberg View, addressed quite well one of the key questions, which is why is health insurance different from buying broccoli or questions about why, why can't the government right, force you to buy, mm -hmm. buy food. And the answer is that in health care, not participating in, imposes costs on everyone else because an insurance market requires uh, yeah, that you have a big well. pool of right. people Whereas and some food people don't need not. the insurance as much as Correct. other people might. So that's a much, an insurance market, especially in health insurance, but in, in many insurance markets, it's a different phenomenon than uh, a traditional market. So I think there is a clear distinction, one that wasn't drawn out as much as Noah pointed out, as, as drawn out as much during oral arguments. But don't forget, the justices so, also have uh, the, lots of amicus briefs and other written materials that uh, are often more important in forming their judgments than the drama of the oral argument. Yeah. Peter, is there a plan B if, if the Supreme Court rules that this is unconstitutional? What can the administration put forward next? Well, I don't think the administration wants to go there, so I'm not sure that there is a plan B that's being developed. But outsiders like Paul Starr have pointed out that you can come close to, not be quite as effective, but you can come close to the impact of a mandate through things like automatically enrolling individuals unless they opt out. So it's not a hard there mandate, but it's like what's happened in many 401k plans where workers are now often enrolled unless they opt out as opposed to having to affirmatively sign up. Just as one example, there's also state level action that could occur, but uh, I don't but think hopefully the White it won't be Plan B. Right, exactly. As far as White House, House is wanna, does not want to be entertain those plan B, right? uh, options right now. Uh, before I let you go, I got to ask you about this economy right now. You know, there seems to be some good news out there, but it's somewhat sporadic. I mean, you look at the housing sector, and, and none of those numbers have looked good. Durable goods coming in less than stellar today. What do you make of the economic data and the direction we're heading in? Well, I think there, obviously there is a sense of positive momentum. I'm somewhat more optimistic than I was at this time last year when there was this budding sense of optimism, and that's just because we're another year through the deleveraging process. Uh, the stock of unsold homes has come down a bit. So uh, things look moderately positive, but we also need to just put this in context. Two or two and a half percent growth is not exactly gangbusters. No, and a lot of people say after what we went through, exactly. we should be seeing a heck of a lot more than this. Yeah, and so as uh, Chairman Bernanke uh, has highlighted this week, one of the big questions is why is the labor market strengthening so much when GDP growth is, you know, uh, going along at two or two and a half percent, and yet the unemployment rate is declining rapidly. That's an odd configuration, and I think one of the big unanswered questions is how long can that last? Yeah, and your thought on that? How long can it last? Well, I think the hope is that it, that the labor market uh, strength will feed back onto consumption into a stronger economy. Uh, I suspect, however, we're going to be in this kind of slow growth, two, two and a half percent growth. Uh, at least for this year. And then by this time next year, we're going to have drama coming out of Washington again oh, yeah. as the debt limit comes back and the tax cuts are expiring, what have you. So yeah. hopefully we will avoid shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Peter Orzag, a pleasure. Thank you so much.